uh, into the um, into the position where it is right now. Um, and I feel really feel proud about the performance and the um, and the kind of education Aramba College is right now practicing. And I hope that it will continue. So without any uh, further uh, delay, and I also like to thank uh, for asking me to come and talk today. So I am not a coronavirus expert. I'm a molecular biologist, biochemist. I am on the verge of um, retiring from active science and uh, going more towards academic leadership. And But I find it fascinating uh, that what is going on. So I will try to shed light on the biochemistry and the molecular biology side of the virus and a little bit from a very different angle than Dr. Sarkar has uh, talked about. Uh, he gave a very illuminating talk uh, and I, I listened to him. Uh, the passion he has is just unbelievable. And uh, I don't know whether I will be uh, able to make a um, justice uh, following his lecture, but I'll try my best, okay? So as has as been said, the title of my lecture, I'm trying to now share my um, screen. Let me just try to... Um, okay, so um, the title of the talk is Corona Rules the World. And I'll come to the point why I use that particular... Sir, it is not visible. Slides are not visible. Not visible? Okay, let me try. Okay, so... Can you see it now? Ah, yeah, now yeah, it's yeah. Okay. It is not visible. Now it is visible. Okay. Okay. I'm making it full screen so that we can see it better. Okay. So, um, so Corona rules the world. So before I start uh, my lecture, I would like to um, dedicate this talk to uh, the great soul uh, on whose name your um, institute has been founded. Um, and uh, I am one of the biggest uh, fan of uh, him. And I think uh, you are really fortunate to have your um, academic certificates name of this great person associated with it. Uh, and I hope that you all will do justice um, for his name and will contribute to the society and to the scientific world on your own way and will try to enhance the prestige of the Institute as much as you can. I feel fortunate to be part of this talk today. So let me just start with the very basic things. Um, so there are two terms that is being very, very frequently used. One is COVID-19, which is the disease. And then um, this is a disease that is a respiratory disease, uh, respiratory tract disease. And then the other term is SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus. And that's how we define the virus, is the name of the virus. And it's a member of the coronavirus family. And um, the, the, the current outbreak actually started from Wuhan, China. And then from Wuhan, China, it kind of took a ride on extreme globalization and got spreaded all over the world in a lightning speed. The reason I say in extreme globalization is because if you go back, uh, essentially back, uh, this kind of pandemic would take a long time to spread over the world. However, these days, because we are so densely, so intensely communicated with the other parts of the world, that it creates spread very quickly. So we have to be careful. There is a price that we have to pay for our scientific advancement, and I think Corona is showing us that this is the price we are paying. That we are recklessly moving forward in a lightning speed to communicate one part of the world to the other mostly for the better reasons, but then are, there are many times we are just doing it just because of our belief and just because of our benefit. And we are looking not at the long-term benefit, we are doing it on the basis of short-term benefit. So we have to be careful in thinking that how we can move in globalization in the future. So I think that's what coronavirus has really opened the door and make us think about it twice. So the pandemic outbreak has started as it kind of distributed all over the world. 
Now, this is the map of British Empire at its peak. It took hundreds of years for the British to rule the world. And if the red image is the one that is shown here, that the British have their hit. And the coronavirus in four months um, kind of spread it all over the world, uh, almost the same intensity as the British Empire. And this is the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Research Center's um, recent update. And this is going to change every day. So you can see how rapidly it got distributed over the world. So it's a very severe type of pandemic, which only took four months in order to spread all over the world. Now it's around six months. This is another pandemic that happened long, long time back. And this is the called the Black Death, uh, which was bubonic plague, which happened in the 13th century in Europe, believed to be originated from Asia, and then it got spreaded to Europe through the ships where they have infected rats that kind of um, spreaded the disease through their ticks. So again, it is distributed by humankind from one continent to the other. But at that time, spread was much slower. And you can see here that the um, I'm trying to get the point option you know, I can show you. Um, just bear with me. Yes. So you can see here that the, the, the pandemic uh, kind of stayed over for a long time. It was from 1946 to 53, almost seven years. And then because of um, that the scientific advancement that has happened over the years is um, unbelievable, and that's why we are thinking of getting a remedy as soon as the end of the year. But that wasn't the case at that time. It was just mere precaution that you have to take in order to be spared by the um, pandemic. So what is coronavirus? I uh, just want to give you a structural view of how it looks like. This is an artist's impression of that how the coronavirus looks like. And this is a cross-section of the coronavirus. So here are a few elements that I will emphasize about it, but before I go, I just want to show you the actual picture in an electron microscopy, how it looks like. And you see all these uh, spikes over here are called the spike protein, and I'll come to the importance of the protein in the um, infectivity of coronavirus. So this is my depiction of coronavirus in a very simple form. So there are a few elements that I want to highlight here about it. Um, you can see here that um, this is the envelope protein. Uh, I'm sorry, the envelope, not the protein. Uh, the gray circle over here. Inside, what we see is the genetic material, which is a positive strand, uh, negative strand RNA. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, negative strand RNA. And then you have the spike proteins, which are sticking outside. You have other proteins called nucleocapsid protein, which helps the DNA, I'm sorry, RNA to be folded into its conformation. So it's kind of a scaffolding protein. And then you have enveloped protein, and then you have the membrane type of protein. Sure. So the virus basically um, when it replicates inside a cell, um, it hijacks the machinery of the cell, and I'll show you in a figure how it does that in a little part of it. So the basic components are the genetic material, which is a um, negative strand RNA. You have the envelope, and I'll come to what the structure looks like, this envelope. Soon. And then we have three important proteins. There are many important proteins, but these are the surface proteins that often are targeted for vaccines because they are kind of exposed to the outside of the virus by the particles. So if you look at the envelope, um, it's basically a lipid bilayer. And since it's a lipid bilayer, you can get rid of the virus in any surface using soap. The reason is that the soap is a detergent which forms micelle and which can actually interact with these liquids to replace them, poke holes, and destroy the structure of the virus. And that's why soap is your best solution in order to get rid of if you have a surface contact. Ethanol will work too because it will also poke holes and disrupt the membrane structure. So remember that 
When you wash your hand, you wash your hand for at least 20 seconds with a shock and enough of it so that you can get rid of the virus in the viral structure by rubbing your hand against each other. So the envelope is sensitive to detergent. Thanks God, that's why you can get rid of it by just washing your hand. Now, how does this replicate? I'll just show you a simple version of it, how this uh, particular virus replicates. So first of all, this RNA, it kind of unwinds it, and um, this positive strand of RNA now creates a negative strand, and that the negative strand creates a bunch of positive strands by replication. And this replication is carried out by a RNA-dependent RNA polymerase which is a viral protein. So the virus carries this protein with it. It synthesizes it inside the cell and it is its own protein. So this particular protein is error prone. So any RNA dependent RNA polymerase has a tendency to make mistakes. And the reason it is favored that way is because that's how you can gain mutations. And the virus can mutate and then the advantage is mutations will survive and will become more infectious or pathogenic with the advantage of the virus. However, we are lucky that the SARS-CoV-2 um, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase is not that error-prone. So the rate of mutation is not as much as it could have been and we have seen in many other viruses. So in that respect, we are a little bit lucky here. So once the genome is synthesized, it will repack and form the circular um, scaffolded form. And then the RNA uh, will also produce uh, proteins by uh, transcription and translation. And then have the lipid bilayer coming from the host cell. That's how you create the intact virus. And when you create the intact virus, the spike proteins are displayed on the outside. So how does it how does it infect us? There are three codes, uh, three ways it can enter inside our body. Um, it could be through oral, nasal, and through your eyes. And most commonly through nasal. Okay, and that's why um, it goes into the respiratory tract. And its favorite site of infection is the lower respiratory tract and ultimately to the lung. So how can it spread? There are four different modes that it can get spread. One is you can have um, contamination by uh, talking to somebody who is infected close enough. You can have direct contact you cannot be in direct contact, somebody who has used a surface and then you use it later. And then you can also be infected through the aerosol. Now the last one is a little bit controversial, but I'll show you there are some studies in China which kind of gives a very nice idea of what is going on. Now if you look at the size of the virus, is 0.12 micron around. And if you look at the droplets that we create when we cough, they are much, much bigger than that. Okay? So it can hold this virus inside it very well. So there are three different types of droplets that we produce when we cough. The one that we call the big size and the large droplets, and this large droplet will not carry over too, too much. It will drop down within few fit and the virus that they are carrying will be dead because obviously it touches the surface. And then we have the medium size and then the most dangerous ones are the ones that are smallest. And they can easily get airborne and can travel for long distance. Even if these are small and these are micro droplets, these micro droplets Hello. are produced in low numbers but they can carry virus even inside themselves. So this is a picture that shows how turbulent black gas cloud, when you cough, kind of travel away from it. And then if it, it gets into a air circulatory system in a building, circulation system, then it probably would get trapped there for a while. 
And this virus can survive for quite a long time in that condition. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay. So here is the study that has been done in China. So when the restaurants got opened um, up in USA and in China, because we thought that we have everything under control, then a report came from a part of China that in a restaurant, um, 26 people were, were infected from one source. And when they looked at the seating arrangement of the people who got infected, they were all from one area of the restaurant. And none of the people who are in the other part got infected. And the infection actually started from one person right over here, says index patient one, A1. Okay. So what they did in China, when they saw that, they did an experiment. They created mannequins which were seated again in that restaurant. And these mannequins can actually spray um, aerosols that has fluorescent level. And you can track where these fluorescent level aerosols are going. And then they looked at the, tried to track where these are going, okay? So they have different colors for the different areas. And they did find that people who were sitting in the extreme side of this wall, it found that all the air that was circulating inside the restaurant was confounded in this particular area. So it has a duct system over here, which was recirculating the air over here. And that's why none of the other people who were sitting really inside the restaurant, virtually next to them, were not infected because this is the area where the people were exposed the most. Now, what the dangerous thing about is that these virus was able to survive in the aerosol form for quite a long time. So that's why if you think that you are going to spend your time in an indoor, try to have your windows open and try not to be in an enclosed environment which has air conditioning in it with multiple people in that room. Okay? Even if you do a six feet distancing, it might not help you. Okay? So that is the take home message that we get from here. So it is very important that you also wear a mask. Wherever you go, carry one, and 100% of the time we are a mask. And we are doing it uh, here religiously. A mask that will be multi layered of cloth, or it has some kind of protection against uh, small particles. You don't need an N95, you can have a lower graded mask, but use it uh, prudently and use it all the time. Okay, this is my advice. Now let us talk about what does this virus do to us, okay? So if you look at um, the coronavirus, and as I said, its main, um, its favorite spot of infection is the lung. It also can infect kidney, but we have only seen uh, infection in the lung most of the time, and that is causing the big problem. So in the lung, this is a picture of a lung alveoli. So in an alveoli, what you have is a... Um, two types of cells. There are green colors shown over here, they are type two, and these blue colors are type one alveolar cells. Okay, now the type one's function is to exchange the gas. So the oxygen to carbon dioxide exchange really happens in these type one cells. The function of the type two cells is they are progenitor of one, so you will get type 1 synthesized from them. And they are also the cells that produce the surfactant. And what is surfactant will come to that, okay? So this is a healthy alveolar space shown over here, and here are the healthy alveoli. And you can see here, this is a cross section showing you that in the epithelial cell layer, how the type 2 and type 1 alveolar cells are present and the oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange is happening right over here. So when a coronavirus infects it, 
The first thing it does, it infects the type 2 and type 1 cells. The type 2 panics and it sends a signal. And this